So yeah, okay. Well, it's been great to kind of ease into this presentation. Um, so this is the, the, you know, I work for the city. I think like, if we go maybe the next slide or two slides. So yeah, this is about me. I kind of, I feel like I've already hijacked part of the last thing, but I manage the RFP process for the city of Chicago for the Department of Family Services. In that role, I'm looking at 93 different program models. We do, you know, depending on the year between a thousand and 13 or 1500 contracts annually. So we do a big shop. Um, I have just in the past year I'm doing, I do probably between 20 to 40 requests for proposals from my department every year for various program models. Um, and that's pretty constant. Um, ARP money, you know, the American Rescue Plan Act, that has bumped me up more towards 40 for the past couple of years. But generally it's always, you know, check our website out, go to that DPS, you know, get the, the, the um, things from DPS, from that e-procurement system, because we're always putting stuff out for our, pop, our, our populations. Um, because of this, and we'll get into this um, in later slides, and it's also a little bit like I, I'm trying not to repeat what some of the stuff that Goody said about, you know, how to sort of look through things. But, you know, I got, we, we have, like we are doing 20 plus state, local, federal, private funds. And we're my budget for the department. My department's budget is, you know, about $450 million these days. Um, we don't get a lot of private funding sources to be honest, but it does happen. It's always fun. Um, and then I just have been, you know, the other thing is, is I really love nonprofits. I have, I'm always on somebody's board. Um, or an LSC or something. It's one of the ways I like to keep myself involved in nonprofit development. My department contracts with hundreds of nonprofits. And so I think that how nonprofit, uh, nonprofits, how nonprofits work and, um, and operate is of high interest to me. I, before I worked for the city and I've been working for the city for quite some time, I actually worked for WBDC where Mora is from and I cannot plug them enough. Uh, as a small business development center, they are really, really um, well positioned to help any small business and that includes nonprofits. People don't like to think of nonprofits as a business, but they in fact are, they're just a sort of different kind of business. Um, so going on to the next slide, what I'm doing in, you know, a lot of what I do for the department is I'm putting those RFPs out, I'm answering your questions, I'm making sure those applications come in, and I'm also, prior to release, we're always, we have our application questions and we develop evaluative criteria. So our application, so when you fill out an application from us, you'll see the questions. Attached to those questions is both how it really, how each question relates to the individual selection criteria that we've outlined in the RFP document, how that selection criteria relates to the scope part of the RFP, and how the um, and then and then each you know each question has a unique has a usually a numerical value which we do not share, and um, although we'll share how much the section is worth, but the individual questions we don't share the values of because that's proprietary, quite frankly. And it also, it, it changes, every every RFP is different. They're all unique and they're all my babies. Um, and then, um, but, the, but each question is gonna have its unique evaluation matrix. So, you know, it will, you know, like obviously if it's not, if it's not a graded question, like what's your name, there's no, there's no, um, there's no guidance, scoring guidance, but everything has a scoring guidance to it. So when you're like, but so that's kind of how it's gonna, what that's what I'm looking at on the back end, but all of this stuff and, and looking at trying to be more helpful about how to craft your application answers, and this reiterates a lot of what Goody was saying, is you know, look if you have them, if you have the time or the ability or you just don't like to sleep, um look at the RFP document and look at the funding source. A lot of funding sources are coming to my department through, you know, my department is the pass through. And so understand that every time it passes through somebody, they usually add some of their values or culture or ideas. 
So with the ARP money, it's coming from the feds. The ARP money has a little bit, you know, every federal funding source is different and they have different things that they will fund, different things that they won't fund and a different philosophy and mission behind it. So um, you'll have to excuse me as I kind of geek out on you, but like a million years ago, you know, in the in the 60s, there were these poverty programs. We're still, we still have some of this poverty program funding that's your CDGA or CDBG or CSBG or Head Start programming. That came out of that, those programs have a really different funding model and idea of how they're going to interact with their end, the end user population than stuff that's coming out of the coming out of ARP or even coming out of Older Americans Act, which came out a little bit later. And so those, those acts all reflect the history or the times that they were written. Um, WIOA would be another one. And you could, and so it's, it's, if you have a minute or, you know, an hour, like just re look at those acts and see what it's going to fund and what it's not going to fund and kind of get a little idea of go, go inside that, like that poor guy that probably was locked in a basement for a summer writing those acts, you know, and figure out what um, maybe a little, you'll fig you can kind of get the flavor of what, what it's supposed to do and how it's supposed to do it. And then understand that every time it goes through an organization, a different federal, or it goes through a different governmental organization, that organization is going to overlay it. So if it's um, Older Americans Act, or if it's even ARPA for, for um, seniors or older people, that that's going to go through the depart the um, Illinois Department of Aging, and they're going to put some of their stuff on it. Um, and then and then with us, it's going to be goes through the mayor's office that has our programs people. So there's a lot of just like you're going to have to kind of suss out the cultures, but that might help you in crafting a good answer. Um, for foundation funding, you often have sometimes larger foundations manage these affiliate funds, and so that will also have like an overlay or something that's a little bit different. So if kind of you understand, um, you know, understanding where the funder is coming from helps, will help you in crafting a program that's more likely to be successful by the culture, mission, and values of that funding source and of that funder. So that's kind of my rant about that. Um, let me go to the next slide. So as um, I think Goody kind of referenced, in my department and in general, I mean, applications are gonna go through the stages on their way for a funding decision to be made. So we're first thing we do, we get all our applications in, we check for the completeness and the ability, like just sort of like the most basic ability for the funder to, to fund you. Um, so we're gonna go through and we're gonna be like, do you have your insurance? Like the biggest thing that we look for and the thing that will really be like, okay, we can't, we're not even going to bother reviewing is like, if you don't have a FIN number, if you don't have a 501c3, there is no way we can, um, there is no way that we, we can enter into a contract with you and we can't go to you the way that, that our, our procurement system works. We can't go to you and say, hey, we noticed you can't do business in Illinois. Like you can find a fiscal agent now. We can't because you applied for the money in your legal name. And so the contract has to be let in your legal name, which on the surface, you're like on the surface, it's like, oh, that seems really unfair, except for the fact that if you think about think about it from a more sort of um, from a legal standpoint, maybe, or from just a more an eviler sort of standpoint of like, I can't just go, I can't like do a bait and switch, basically. Um so. We're gonna, so the first thing we're gonna do is like basically go through that, that like, can you in fact, can we in fact get in, you know, do give you a contract? And then we're gonna go through a qualitative evaluation of your application questions and your answers. And we're gonna ask ourselves most basically, like, did you answer the question asked? You'd be surprised how many times people don't. And then did you provide enough details that relate to the question asked? Um, and then from there, you know, and then it's, you know, but like basically what we're really looking for is did you answer the question and did you give us enough detail? That's, it's not any more complicated than that. I'd love to make it more complicated, I guess, because it might make, take up more time. But in the end of it all, just ask yourself, like, did you answer the question? Did you tell me enough? And then we're going to determine a recommendation for funding off of that. Sometimes there are things, other things that we look at that are kind of things that you, you know maybe you can't control you as an applicant can't control so much like um 
And those are always included in the evaluation criteria and selection criteria that we put. So it will be like, you know, sometimes we're looking for a certain geography. Sometimes we're looking that you serve a specific subpopulation of the population where we are trying to serve through the, through the RFP or through, through the program. And then we determine a recommendation for funding. So understand that the applicant, like the evaluator, makes a recommendation. So I spent last Friday reading evaluations and I made my recommendations. I give them to the program people in my department. The program people meet as a group with their, the program manager or the program director, and they make for a first cut of who they think that they want to fund. And generally it's because like every application gets a score from zero to a hundred. And we generally look at the pile of applications that we have and figure out where the cutoff is. And it's really, just that, that, just that. Now they can make recommendations for funding, but they aren't the people who make the final, they, that they don't autonomously get to make that decision. So they then are gonna go in my department to the executive team. And in some cases, the mayor's office is involved with this. I think it depends on the funding source. And, and they're going to make their proposal, they're, they're gonna pr present, these are, our recommend, these are our funding recommendations, and then it's gonna be approved. Now, this is the same in the foundation world, like understand that very, like really nobody has like a full complete autonomy to just give you an hour, you know, to give you a contract or a grant. It's always gonna be a multi-step, multi-person, approval process. Exactly. I'm looking at the ASL interpreter and I love like the multi, the, the signs that she's making for like multi-step, multi-approval. It, it really works for me. Um, so understand, you know, almost always one person is going to re recommend funding and another is going to approve the funding. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And then, so in preparation, so understanding that's your landscape, in preparation, you know, familiar, it's just like what Goody had just said, familiar yourself with our the scope requirements, the program description, look at the selection criteria and check for any indication of weight. We have generally five different sections and they are weighted. Understand like when, I, when you look down there in our reasonable costs section is weighted 10 and it only has three questions. You know, assign your, assign your energy to answering those questions, you know, uh, you know, just decide, uh, you know, accordingly in that, like, if it's only 10 points, don't spend hours, spend hours on the 40 point question. None of this is, is brain surgery, I might add. Um, and so under, and if nobody is sharing the weights, because some departments don't understand that your grant, that the people who you're applying to, the your evaluators, the grant makers are going to try to find out these basic things, which is number one, and it's kind of what I was saying before, is your organization capable of doing the work proposed? So we're looking for your general administrative and organizational capacity. We're looking if you have prior experience, both direct or adjacent to what this program scope is. So we're gonna look for, can we somehow suss out that you've had a success that's relevant to what you, you're asking to do now? Does your organization have the administrative depth to manage the contract of a requested size? So when I see a $60,000 a year organization applying for a million dollars, that's, yeah, that, that is gonna, that's a little bit concerning to me because I don't, because I'm all for growth, but that's a lot of growth, you know? Um, and then does your organization have experience with the desired service population or geographical area? So that is kind of, if they don't, if, if for some reason the selection criteria is not clicking with you or you're not, it, it's, it's just not there to one degree or another, these are the four things that I think most funders are really going to be asking, being, they're, they're going to be asking themselves and they're going to be asked by whoever is going to be approving or, or, you know, helping to approve the funding recommendations. Because over what we really want is we want this money to be spent. We want this, we want to be able to tell what we did with it and report to our funders about it or our boards. 
and we want to we want every you know we want everybody to have a successful experience so we want the program person to have a successful experience we want the business the nonprofit to have a successful experience we want to have a successful experience and we want the people who gave us the money to also be pleased so that you know that's what we're ultimately looking for so let's go to the next thing. I think this is when I started doing some examples. Um, so uh, questions or section. Yeah, the, just answer the stuff that's weighted more. I already talked about that. So we'll go to the next question. And then, you know, this is in terms of writing, how, how to answer an application question. Okay, first of all, give yourself time to do a good job. I can see in the e-procurement system, I look at who I can see who's going in and looking I can see where you're at and how many application questions you've uploaded I can I know that we give people really tight timelines and that that's sometimes not fair I also know that people work offline a lot but give yourself a lot of time to do these things <coughs> um I, I can't stress that enough it's it's easier you know I know it's Everybody has more than enough work to do, but but give yourself a lot of time to do a good job because you can then you can go back and check. Um, there's no harm like turn it in early or let have it be able to sit on the shelf for a month for a week and then go back and see what if you change your mind or if you see something that you didn't see in terms of your answers. But I think that time is the is the best thing um, that the the biggest gift you can do is to start early. Um, try not to be sloppy. It's hard for us to read uh, or to, to read answers that are not proofread or spell checked. Um, if, if only because sometimes like I don't, I, I can't, you know, like I don't understand your misspelling. I, I'm like the person that needs spell check the most. And I routinely leave words out of sentences that I'm writing. So proofread or get somebody to proofread yourself. And again, if you have the time, then you can find somebody to proofread. Um, complete sentences are easier to read and understand. We all write incomplete sentences, but the complete ones really is, it's all about like, can I figure out what you want? Um, show, don't tell. Okay, so I just, as I said, was reviewing applications last week. And so I went in and looked and giving you some examples. So literally here is the question, does your agency have a personal policy manual, affirmative action plan, and grievous procedures? If not, will you develop and put these policies into place before contracting with the city? And so telling is the answer that I received in one application. And this was something that somebody did turn in and it says, yes, it does. Showing is, you can see here, yes, we maintain all of the aforementioned procedures, which are posted publicly at program sites according to funder requirements and regulations. The procedures are also accessible to all employers via the organization's intranet site. Respondent also uploaded the policy manual procedures as an attachment in their application. So if I had six points to give to this person, if I could knock them from 100 points to a 94, who do I give, you know, who do you think gets the six points? I mean, don't all answer at once. Um, so that's what I mean by showing, don't telling, don't, you know, like, as I, and, and as I said in a prior slide, like I'm looking, we are looking to have an answer that responds to the question and gives us enough detail. Yes, it does, lacks a little detail. So here's the, let's go to the next slide. Um, and then we're gonna be, okay, I see this a lot. I've written a lot of things with circular logic. So circular logic is when you say things like the president is a good leader of the United States is a good leader because they are a leader of this country. My organization is the best application applicant for this after school youth program because we are experienced in providing services to after school in an after school setting for youth. I see that that is not enough detail for me to make a decision. Again, you should be like my organ. You know, give me facts. Give your reader facts. Help your reader out. We all want to give you the money. You just, but you know, again, my organization is the best applicant for this after school youth program because for X number of years we've served X number of youth ages this in an after school format from these, you know, according to our annual satisfaction survey. Like, give the more details you can give us. And this is this level of detail, which is you can see is providing a sort of more, a, a richer, deeper, more attractive answer than the paragraph above is why. I also sort of say that, you know, a 
sole proprietor is oh, with no help is perhaps going to be a stretched applicant and a stretched a stretched applicant and a stretched um, provider because we want this level of detail and we're going to want this level of detail in your reports as opposed to just like you being like yeah we're the right you know we did it and um, this is true so let's go to the next question the next slide and then be detailed. Um, this was, I can, you know, here's the question, which was please describe how you will identify and recruit a broad range of stakeholders, including but not limited to youth, face bank organizations, social influencer, youth serving organizations, block club leaders, CPS administrators, like who didn't we put into this question? To attend monthly convenience and contribute to the development of the community plan, include details about how you will encourage stakeholders to, to consistently attend meetings and participate in the development of the community stand. The one answer was we will utilize our relationships with community schools and business partners throughout the city of Chicago. That is an answer. And I really, really, really wish they had continued with those thoughts and not just given me that one sentence. Um, because this was a, you know, this was an organization I like, I would have loved to have given these people some money, but you can't just say the one sentence response. It probably didn't, you know. I don't know, probably didn't work out in sixth grade. It's not going to work out now. I'm giving you what, $250,000? Know? And so here is the answer. You know, here's another answer. We will employ several methods to identify and recruit a broad range of stakeholders. And so here we talk social media. And let's go to the next slide. So they talked about their social media stuff. They talked about their community outreach. They talked about their referral networks. They talked about their surveys and the focus groups they're going to be doing for us. Let's go to the next slide. They talked about their online platforms. Um, it's important to note that working with CPS, you know, we'll be doing this, we'll be doing with that. And then we're gonna, and then if that was not enough, we're going to attend other community events and, net, and meetings to network and recruit community stakeholders. Like at this point, I wanna invite these people over to dinner just because they've written me such a lovely answer. Um, and I understand like, this is a lot of work which is why I say start early. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So that's how I would say to answer your application questions. Let's look a little bit at the budget. So the budget, weirdly enough, in my department, and this is not, I speak only for my department um, on this, the budget for us is a fairly plastic and mutable document. We want to see that you can do a budget. We want you to upload your budget. We're gonna look, but we're what you apply for, for the most part, we will most likely um, reorganize the budget for you and give you what we want. Um, when you look for the budget, determine the following. We look at leverage. You know, what other, what other things are you leveraging into this? Um, for the most part, we understand that you're going to be leveraging something. This, as I mentioned before, the size of your ask versus your overall operating budget. Um, generally speaking, don't ask for, don't try to double your your operating size unless you're really tiny. Like if you're a twenty thousand dollar organization and you're asking for a twenty thousand dollar grant, yes, fine, go for it. If you're a $250,000 organization and you're asking for a $250,000 grant. That's, I think that that's that kind of size is when I would start kind of being questioning because I want to just make sure that I don't inadvertently put you out of business. I don't know, Maura, do you have anything that you would want to say about, about the size of an ask versus the size of an operating budget? No, actually. <laughs> I'm <laughs> loving hearing what you're saying because I get a lot of questions about this. Um, and I, some, I, I had, it's hard to articulate is the problem. Um, so it's helpful for me to hear what you're saying about, you know, doubling your budget. Cause some, what it, I think Julia, what you're really saying is it's kind of just a feel, you know, it's not a hard and fast rule. Um, and that's usually what I counsel, you know, not doubling is helpful. Um, well, so, the other well, thing is, is it's just really it's, it's a feel thing, but it's also like, I want you to be in business so you can apply for more of my stuff. Yeah. If the worst case scenario is I don't pay you for six months, 
Yeah. Am I going to, are you going to die? Like, am I going to put you out of business? Are you gonna be, yeah. And so that is what I have to, that when, when we are making, when we are looking at funding, that is something that we have to put in the back of our mind because we are stewards of public dollars. And that means that we, as, as stewards of public dollars, we need, we want that money out on the street and we can't, it's not going to be on the street if we put you out of business, you know? Yeah. And someone actually just said in the chat, um, how can a large request put you out of business? And this is what I kind of get into companies with is that you have employees that you have to pay. You have to keep making payroll in order for those employees to keep working for you. So if you run out of money because the city hasn't paid you and you have to continue providing services and you don't have any employees to provide those services, that's how you get out of business, unfortunately, because you just can't keep the doors open and the lights on. Um, and so that's kind of like the reasonable, reasonable yeah, so test. We're always looking to see if you have a line of credit. We're always looking to see if you have other organizations, you're getting grants or you're getting contracts with other people besides us. Um, or even just us. I mean, that's sort of okay as well. But but the idea is, is like, oh yeah, as Maura said, a large request can put you out of business because say this was a long, long time ago. I don't think it's ever happened, but we did have at some point, like 20 years ago, we gave an organization $1.5 million to do work for us. And we didn't pay them for a year. So now that organization was actually, I think they were a, a conglomerate of a national organization so that they could float that while it was all being stussed out and they kept their doors open. And ultimately it was a huge win, but most organizations are not gonna be able to float a $1.5 million contract for a year while you and the city hash it out over how you didn't voucher correctly or whatever the issue was. Um, so that's what, you know, I don't wanna put you out of business. So getting back to the slide, thank, thank you so much, Maura. Um, that we look at the size of the ask versus the overall bu operating budget. We're looking at what cost categories you are budgeting for and how well you are or are not paying your staff. I know that as somebody who was in the grant writing you know, game before I came to the city and we started doing this, I know that sometimes, you know, like we get creative what, what I say about staff salaries or I would you know, it's sort of like, how did I even out an ask? You know, I would put it into this, that, this, that, or the other category. But I do look um, to make sure that they're being paid minimum wage um, to just kind of keep an eye on like, you know, is there a discrepancy? Like, you, you know, your your line worker is making 30 grand, but somehow the ED who's charged to 5% of the grant is making 200. Like, you know, I do look, we do look at those things. To be honest, we don't, there's no questions. We don't grade on it. I just look at it. <laughs> Um, and then generally, we're never going to give you more than you ask for, but we will give you less. And so I would say there's no harm in applying. If we say that the range of funding is one, you know, one to $400,000, there's no harm in applying for more. Don't apply for five. Don't apply for 401. But there's no harm in applying for four if that's the right fit and you can handle it. If you're a tiny organization, don't apply for four just because you can apply for what's the fit, but there's no, I would say like doing a little bit of a reach on that is there's no harm. A lot of times we're just like, we're going to give you $250,058 and 12 cents. And that is that. And so apply for that. Don't apply for more because then we're just going to re, re that's what we have to give you. And that's, we're going to, we're going to just manipulate your budget on, you know, and make it that way, make it fit. So that's what I have to say about budgets. Um, and then here, this is how you get a hold of me. If you want to talk to me or call me, I tend to, I try to call or return everything in 24 hours. If you do any kind of RFP action or application for the Department of Family Foot Services, you heard me on a webinar perhaps, or you have this phone number plastered somewhere because it's around, it's, it's around the internet everywhere. Um, so, I'm looking here at these questions. Uh, and so I see, thank you, Maura. Yeah, I can't, I can't encourage people to go to the WBDC enough. They're really one of my favorite organizations and I'm, I am both biased and unbiased in my statement. Um, does the city provide points for organizations run and or serving 
uh, POC organizations and or organizations that serve hard to reach communities. Well, pretty much if you're going to my department, it's, it's a hard to reach community. Um, we actually delegate agency contracts because they tend to be more social service contracts are exempted from the targeted population or the targeted restrictions. So you don't actually get extra points from us the way you would for um, a, like a service or a service contract with the city for being a minority owned or disability owned, you know, any kind of owned business organization. We don't we, we don't have a preference. Additionally, I don't know what the stats are, but generally speaking, we have, you know, we have a lot of P organizations that are POC and, and everybody who we're contracting with is serving a hard to serve community. Um, I don't think that there are any homeless people that are easy to serve personally. So, I mean, we're talking, my department does youth, we do early childhood, we do um, older Americans, we do victims of domestic violence, we do, you know, homeless people, um, returning citizens, none of, and, and for the most part, things like youth and, and early childhood are mostly, we're looking at lower income people who, or lower income youth, or lower income early childhood stuff. So there's, there, there's no, no extra points, I'm afraid. Um, word limits, we, the, just so you know, the e-procurement system that everybody has to go through except for a D case is limited to 4,000 characters per answer. And that includes punctuation and spaces. We're actually working on a reboot of that system. And I was, one of the things I requested was that the, the system would actually tell people when they went over the limit. Currently it doesn't, it just cuts you off and you won't really find out until after you submitted, <laughs> which is why I tell people to always work in a different, like a word perfect, you know, like a, a some sort of word perfect word word software, and save their answer. The other thing is, is that once you submit that application, you're really not going to have any access to it easily. You'll get it in a PDF format, but other than that, like if you want to reuse that language, put it in. Don't put it. Don't keep it in e-procurement. E-procurement is for making applications, and that's kind of all it does. It's not going to help you. It's not like cyber grants. It's not going to help you. Um, with that with that aspect of writing an application. Um, so yeah, 4,000 characters in that spaces and, and punctuation, which is like a really boring tattoo that I could get. Um, let's see. Yeah, as people say, <laughs> they've seen payments lag. That's very true. It's, uh, it's stressful. Um, and then, the webinar is for City of Chicago, but is there a similar program slash resource center for international service provision? So I would open that up to Maura or Goody or Maggie, any of you. I don't, I, I don't, don't actually know the answer to that question. Maura, you need to unmute. I, I'm talking myself. I don't know what an international, I don't know what that is. So I would say no, um, but maybe. I don't know, Goody, do you have a thought? Um, I think that a question is related and by Lisa, if you wanna unmute, are you looking for funding in our international funding opportunities? If so, we can look into uh, it, but um, yes. again, our focus right now is the city of Chicago. I know it's kind of off topic, but um, I was just thinking about that as we're talking about um, this process i'm writing some notes and stuff down but i could also probably talk with the school of public health um and the global health program as well but thank you definitely reach out we're, we're here for you and then kayla i know you've been compiling and julia you've been reading but kayla i'm gonna toss it back to you see if we overlooked anything um no we're getting them all so far um i just want to remind folks to put questions in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom um, and we can pass the mic over to you. But the, the next question that we have, um, has there been an increase in the number of small nonprofits that have been awarded grants since the beginning of the program? Um, that is a question that I do not know the answer to. I would have to check. Um, 
if it's probably not, uh, I mean, generally speaking, since, and this was a long time ago now, but since, you know, we don't have as many over, over the past couple of, over the past decade, at least, I would say that most of our provider pools have shrunk. There are few pe fewer people doing this work, and I see somebody nodding. There are fewer people in the it, who are doing this work and who are capable of actually doing the work. And the when the state had their budget crisis, you know, what, ten years or however many years ago, that really that 24, 24 months of not having the state pay out um, really knocked a lot of organizations out of out of business or or they shifted there are also people you know there are also organizations that as part of that experience decided they were not they were going to move away from government funding they just don't want to deal with the government and and that is you know that is a business model that if, if they can make it work power to them you know <laughs> We do provide big, you know, we do, we will give you a lot of money, but we come with a lot of requirements. Um, and the the operations, like pe people, I don't think people always understand like this, we're operating with public dollars. These are your, this is your, everybody's money. Um, and so there's a lot of report, reporting requirements because the general public, whose dollars we are spending on behalf, you know, of this, of the country, have, do have a right to know how their dollars are being spent, but that means that we're we have overhead. Um, you know, there's like no such thing as a one and done. I think in, in government, because you know, in theory, the entire country should have the ability to understand where that money went, how it was spent, to a to a, a pretty fine degree. <laughs> um, can, oh, I can see I have there's a, a long list of awardees. Can I have a follow up to that question? That was my question. Uh, the purpose of this program is to, when we did the first summit, is that the city was saying that smaller nonprofits are not applying for the grant. So is the city uh, being uh, deliberate and, and making that, they say where well, the need is, there's not a lot of small nonprofits are applying. So is there another, way that the city could uh, support that, encourage that, uh, because we know that the process is complicated. But if the notion is, is that if they want more smaller nonprofits that do exist and that might be interested, what things, and I know, um, and the, the technical assistance is really uh, special and important, but when the rubber meets the road in terms of the actual application process and awarding of grants, uh, I remember at the first, they said that they wanted to be deliberate with that. So it would be good to be able to have that data to see whether it's happening or not. So I think to answer your question more, like that, thank you for that clarification. I think that when we, what we have looked at through some of our ARPA funding, funded stuff is we have started to examine or try to reduce barriers for both smaller organizations or organizations that for whatever the reason are not gonna do well with a paper application. So one of the things that we have done, especially with our youth programming, and I'm just looking at my like list of RFPs that I've been super excited about is that we've been doing an oral presentation and that adds a ton of time. <laughs> it's so much time. So like, you know, I, I reviewed six or seven applications last week. It, that review process, I'm a seasoned reviewer, blah, 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 blah. And so it takes me, what, five hours to review seven applications. I'm now looking at ne my next week where I am literally scheduled now for seven hours of meetings because we're doing oral presentations. <laughs> and that's like, not even like, you know, that's like, that's just the meetings, not even like the prep or, or the after chat or like whatever. Um, however, that being said, I do think that is or has been really effective in reducing barriers because I like I found in the times that I have participated in this process prior that it really flips the switch on the script on the kind of organizations that we want to go with. The other thing that we have to talk about, though, is 
What's the staffing level to provide the ongoing technical assistance that a smaller or younger or less experienced organization might need from the city? Um, we want to make, as I said, we want to set people up for success. And so that means that like the program person has to a, have the support themselves and the knowledge themselves, but also, you know, they're going to need to be on deck a little bit more with that organization because they're new and they don't know. And it's going to be more devastating if they have to wait for 70 days to get reimbursed. <laughs> so, okay. Um, then you said, there's a question here about the, we, I mentioned something about rewriting budgets that was sent to you when deciding grant amounts. I, I, and how do we go about, that's a, that's a process that would happen. It doesn't happen at the, at the decision-making, like the yes or no, do we want to fund you or not process. That's a process that would, you would enter in, that would know, would be addressed during the contracting process. So we'll make a decision as a department be like, yes, we want to fund this person. And then when it goes into contracts, that's where the negotiation and the budget stuff will start happening. But then we'll tell you, you know, there'll, there'll be a decision about like how much money we have to allocate. And I'll much call money. Over with sure and see if they have any. Um... Um. So somebody says they'd like to see an equity committee for POC led and serving organizations. The city is really involved and maybe Goody can talk to this better. We've been, I know that the city has been part doing a lot of work around equity, inclusion and diversity. Um, city's a big place though. And so some of that stuff trickles down more, not as quickly as, as any of us would like. Um, and then what is the minimum and maximum grant size for this program? There's, there's lots of different programs and they all have different sizes. Um, I would just to address the equity, um, you are correct, there is, so there is a equity dashboard. You know, I would also encourage spending some time on the city's website. There's a lot of effort that it has happened. I can speak to, um, the, uh, the grants and funding that have been focused for health related. Um, the, and I think this was a question before, there have been targeted um, funding opportunities for hard hit areas or high need areas. And that is something that is often listed in different RFPs. Um, so if you are serving a certain population or within a certain geographic area, sometimes there are requests specific to that. Um, but I know that there are efforts being made. There's also a health equity zones. Um, again, those are focusing on the health aspects, but I believe that there are, is effort um, around all of the city of Chicago to address um, equity citywide. Yeah, and then uh, to, to just follow up with Goody, a lot of times we're actually, uh, the, especially with our youth stuff and I, a lot of the ARPA stuff, we, we really do, we're looking to, we're targeting the 15 neighborhoods or areas, the health areas for the pro, for the program implementation sites. Um, okay, so here's, when applying for a grant under a fiscal sponsorship, is the city or city considering the financial position of the sponsor or the, both organizations? It depends on what you include and how you present. Um, and how much your the how much the non the the subcontract organization how much work they're going to do and then how much information you include about that organization to um, you know in the application as to how we'll consider it so we're going to default to the fiscal health of the of the fiscal agent of the applicant so that if that is missing, that's gonna be problematic because ultimately we're looking to enter into a legal agreement with that organization and we're going to be judging their fiscal health um, because they are gonna be getting the money um, and they are gonna be giving that money to you but they could also be doing Lord knows what else, right? So we, you know, so if you're coming in with a fiscal agent, we wanna see that fiscal agent's 
paperwork and they're, we want to make an assessment about their financial health, but it's also helpful. You know, we're never going to not look at whatever you send us for better or for worse. And so if you send us information about your organization, we're going to mostly be focusing though on your organization's ability to do the work and less amount about like back taxes or, or whatnot. That is all the questions in the chat, but we do still have some time. Um, so if folks wanna come off mute or raise their hand, um, go ahead and ask away or put more um, questions in the chat. I don't, we don't usually save the chat um, and post that. I know somebody just asked that. There may be a way for you to save it yourself if you wanted a copy of it, but um, we will be, um, we are keeping track of all the questions that are asked, and I believe we will be sharing the answers to those questions. So if that would be helpful, um, that will be available. Um, this, yeah. is, this is Norma from Greater Auburn Gresham Development Corporation. I will add just one comment of encouragement. Um, the city has a great amount of funding for all of us. I think collaboration is definitely one of the right ways, but there are also smaller um, funds out there for smaller nonprofits. And one of the ways the Greater Auburn Gresham Development Corporation has um, has helped with this equity issue is to start a fund just for nonprofits, small nonprofits. So I will put some information in the chat about that and ask you to always be looking for that. And that's why this is important. This project is so important to us because we want you to be ready and we're partners, long-term partners with the city. And this in and of itself is one of the major um, actions that they put in place to try to eliminate that gap with you guys not having access to the right resources. And, and so I say, get ready and keep getting ready. More and I are going to keep training you guys to get ready and don't just think about, you know, you're not ready yet for these, for these funds because you will be ready and there are other funds that will, as soon as we know about, we will let you know as well. So stay encouraged about that. Just get um, the tools you need along the way to get ready. So I just wanted to offer that encouragement. Um, I see another question about city debt and grants. Um, could you maybe be a little bit more specific about what you want to know about city debt and grants? Yeah, I just think um, that often catches people by surprise that if they have parking tickets or there's an issue like that, and it, it didn't come up yet. And so I just wanted to ask that maybe that be just, you know, thrown out there for everyone to be aware of. Um, I don't think that's changing anytime soon, but I'd love to be wrong. <laughs> well, I know when you start working for the city, they do a scan on basically any debt that you might have and take it out of your first paycheck. <laughs> um, I also know that at one point, this was a year, years ago, that, that like every contract that we did had to be checked by every organization that it might, you know, every other department that might it might owe debt to and that we had to like let that go because we wouldn't really have any organizations. Well, it's, that's interesting, Julia, because I've worked on contracts where like at one point the city was going to the extreme of looking at business licenses, finding all the social security. Yeah, that cards. was like, it was like that. It was like, and it you was, know, like your board member from five years ago didn't pay their water bill. <laughs> 10 years oh, ago and, and at that point it, like and it took a thousand years so like it was gonna it, it meant that like our contracting time which was which we're always trying to make less lengthy as it is was like like it was just like okay great we can do one contract a year now you know um, so and then i'm looking here thank you guys for 
um, all of the nice things you're saying. Uh, me, re, the grants offered in our, am I looking at smaller nonprofits? We're looking at, you know, like we're looking at people who can do the work that we need to have done. Some organ, some, I think there are some pots of money and some RFPs that are more suitable for smaller nonprofits than others. Uh, for instance, are, you know, like it's probably really hard to do anything with homeless people, especially providing shelter, unless you're a certain size. That's just, you're, you're probably, you know, you're probably not gonna, gonna be able to do that. It may be, if it was a, a very small outreach, you might be able to impact that population, but like, you know, right size yourself or to the, the population and the, the requirements, service requirements associated with that population. Youth programs, we have lots and lots of youth development organizations and they tend to be able to be smaller, um, not just because youth are sometimes physically smaller, but because they're just, it, there's, you can, you know, there's summer programs and the summer program doesn't have, you know, an organization running a summer program successfully doesn't have to be that big. Um, it also can be, a, you know, if you're just doing a very simple, uncomplicated after school program for 10 kids. And that might be, we might actually fund somebody that just does 10 kids. That's something that can be done with, you know, with a smaller overall budget. So just, you know, look, you know, every, every, this is like where it comes down to the business aspect of it. Like every market, you know, every business up market or every, every niche has its own kind of like right-sized organization in terms of what you're able can be able to do. And it's just knowing what just knowing what the service provision load is and how it's and how it bears out. Um, so let's see. We did have one question that I might have got lost in the mix, but they were asking about um you co-signed an organization that you previously worked with earlier. Could you repeat the name? I think. Was that maybe referring to WBBC? Yes, go to go to Mora, go to the WBBC, they will help. Or to Norma, but Or yes. to Norma, I'm sorry. Come to Norma. either of us. I can't go, do all of it. So that's go to Mora, Mora and Norma. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, thank you. Um, Am I saying if a board member owes the city of Chicago will not affect your grant request? I, I hope it will not affect your grant request. Um, programs versus operational grants. We really don't do operational grants. We do program grants. I mean, we're gonna give you money to do a program. We're very, very rarely, probably never gonna give you money just to, to be you. Unfortunate, yeah. I, I wish that we we did because I understand general operating funds are really important and critical and underfunded. But but again, it's it's like um, think about how that would if if you by taking our money now need to be transparent to the entire country as to what you're doing. Like it doesn't really like the the country is probably not in a place where they're just like I gotta you know like hey we're giving fifty thousand dollars for this person to just exist that's probably not going to do it for them <laughs> um but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen maybe somebody else maybe another department does that um so this kind of is related to that and so the question asks are most of the grants programmatic or are some back office so are there any operational funds that um, are provided to support the programs that the grant relates to? Um, I am going to default to Goody or to somebody who might know more about what other departments might be doing, but I can't think of one instance in my department where that is, where we have done anything about systems. I mean, some of this systems upskilling leadership board stuff is actually, I believe, supported by things like this, which are contracts unto themselves, perhaps. But I don't, but that's, my department is never, my department's very program oriented, so that's not the kind of funding that we tend to do. Like, every once in a great while, we'll ask somebody to administer something for us, but it's almost never about upskilling or leadership board development.
Um, I would, I, you know, I think the upskilling leadership board. Um, let us look into it. I don't want to say something that's that's incorrect. I think there are opportunities, but I, I think, um, as Julia just said, I think it it's more of a somebody is funded to support those types of opportunities to grow um, versus direct dollars to your organization to do that, um, which is what I think Julia was saying. Such as yeah. an example, we um, we are very we're very stingy about giving individual organizations individual dollars to help them grow themselves. The idea is that we are collectively, the city of Chicago is collectively growing uh, infrastructure with equity, right? So it isn't picking one or, or one organization or the other. Um, there might be other sources that we can uh, help cite if if appropriate. And I saw Maggie come on. I don't know if you had it. Maybe not. Hi, I'm hand up. I don't know if you can see that. I was, so just for clarity, because you kind of answered my question, but for clarity, um, so the name of this, uh, but then um, uh, Julia says that her department does not fund um, operational grants. So what what department? How is your department different? I I may I may have missed the name of exactly what department you're in, Julia. Oh, I'm in the Department of Family and Support Services. So we will pro we do program our our RFPs are program based and you can have an administrative line, but we're never going to uh, we don't ever have RFPs and we have, or perhaps it's more accurate to say, we we have never to date that I can recall had an RFP where we just give money operating, we just give money for operating costs without a programmatic component. Oh, okay. So that's just for your department, but overall the information that we're getting, we can apply, there are RFPs for uh, operational uh, costs for uh, capacity building and other departments. I do not believe that that is an easy thing to, I don't, I don't think you're going to find that in government funding. You might find it in foundation funding. Oh, more okay. Oh. Yeah, I was going to say that's a private funding type of concept. Government is, I've never seen a government RFP that really had, you know, here's just some money for your operations, which is of course what you need um, sometimes as a not-for-profit. Um, but yeah, that's something you can look at foundation for. Um, you know, found I've kind of talked to some of my client, you know, the, comp the nonprofits I've worked with about finding those types of grants to help support what you're doing. Um, but yeah, you're not going to get that in the government context. What they do do is like, you know, if you, you know, can say that this program is 5% of your operations, and then you have this software that you use, you can take 5% of that software cost and put that in your budget and get reimbursed for that, but they're not going to reimburse you for 100% of that software cost if it's, do you see what I'm saying? It's only a portion of your operations. Yeah, I get it. Okay, thank you. And with that, I think we're going to wrap up this section, um, but if folks have remaining questions, you can continue to put them in the chat and we will be compiling them. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, oh my gosh, thank you guys. Yeah, and now, yes, we'll have a little bit of a break, um, so please come back at 1120 um, for our next next section. <laughs>